At Mill Dam Creek, Virginia, an old warrior has come up river from the sea to die where she was born, ending her life amidst the swamp grass and rusted hills of a junkyard for ships. Her final destiny is to be broken up into scrap, some of it for the steel mills of a one-time enemy who could not defeat her. On this sunlit flight deck and in the darkness below, on a certain day, such acts of greatness were performed that they will be honored forever, even by those who least honor war. Here, men fought and freely offered their lives, not to destroy an enemy, but to save their shipmates. In so doing, they created a legend and became the most decorated crew in the history of the United States Navy. Serving aboard the USS Franklin, to me, is one of the biggest experiences of my life, and I don't think I will ever forget, as long as I ever live, being part of the Franklin. I can't think of anything more moving or touching than having been a member of the crew of the Franklin. I'm extremely proud. Trucker, executive, priest, insurance man, teacher, policeman. On March 19, 1945, most of them were boys. Boys of 18, 19, 20. And they saw more death in minutes than men see in a lifetime. But they also witnessed valor, extraordinary valor, in others and within themselves. A quarter century later, the memory of that day still binds them together. It brings them back for a last hour with a ship they love. While we're, what's left of us are very, we had a wonderful crew, beautiful crew. Some of them I remember, some of them I don't. But we all have one thing in common and we all feel the same about this ship. A ship by itself is nothing but a lot of steel, a lot of machinery. And it isn't until you put people on board her that she becomes a real thing. I don't think I will ever forget it, or shall we ever forget our shipmates that we left behind. Today, we're mighty proud to be part of it. We're proud that we were on board it. what went on aboard this ship 23 years ago is something which cannot be expressed in words. A ship that once housed 3,400 men stands silent, haunted by 3,400 dramas that added together have made the story of the U.S comparable epic of the sea.
An amazing ship, the Franklin. As a Navy lieutenant in 1945, I was attached to a film unit that met her when she reached New York after traveling 13,000 miles from off Japan, the most heavily damaged U.S. Navy ship ever to make port under her own power. This model gives you an idea of the immensely complicated world of an Essex-class carrier. Fifteen stories high, a flight deck the length of three football fields, 540 separate compartments, and one and a half miles of passageways. Here, the population of the town lives and works in various divisions. Engineering, navigation, gunnery, air group, each a separate neighborhood. On such a ship, two men can serve together a whole year without ever meeting. Yet, though separated by ten decks, they must work together with a unity and precision that alone can make this enormous ship, with all its infinite and intricate parts, a fighting force. The 27,000-ton Franklin was built in ten months launched at Newport News, Virginia in October 1943 as CV-13, our 13th carrier vessel, our fifth warship named for Benjamin Franklin. Her crew, from the start, called her Big Ben. After months of testing and training, the Franklin sails west to Pearl Harbor. There, on June 15, 1944, she is ordered to stand out to sea and to battle as the newest among the many thousand ships of our Pacific fleet, the armada the world has ever seen. A carrier, that lopsided beauty, has one purpose in life, to serve as a floating airfield. On the Franklin, 2,400 men of the ship's company and 1,000 men of the air group work around the clock to service, gas, and arm a hundred planes and put them into the air. Fighters, bombers, torpedo planes, whose mission is to destroy enemy ships, planes, and bases, and help protect the carrier itself from enemy attack. On reporting for duty, CV-13 plunges at once into the great battles of the Pacific that in the last years of the war are driving a Japanese back island by island from their conquered territories to the homeland. Iwo Jima, Guam, Peleliu, Okinawa, Formosa, the Philippines. Under command of her first skipper, Captain James M. Shoemaker, the Franklin carries out her mission with deadly success. Enemy warships sunk or damaged, 34. Enemy merchant ships sunk or damaged, 126. Enemy planes destroyed or damaged, 338. Combat sorties flown, 3,971. In her first four months of service, Big Ben comes through 27 actions with hardly a wound. October 29th, 1944, off the Philippines, she becomes the dead-eyed target of a Japanese suicide pilot, a comical killing 56 men of the Franklin crew and wounding 60. Five months later, whole again, the Franklin has joined Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher's Task Force 58. It's 50 miles across the sea. Mission? to destroy the enemy's home airfields and the remnants of his fleet now huddling in the home ports. Big Ben is also serving as flagship for Rear Admiral Ralph Davison. It is March 19, 60 miles off Japan. Bombers are brought up from the hangar for a heavy strike that starts launching at 6.53 a.m. Ben now has a new skipper, 
Captain Leslie E. Garys. Most of the original crew has been replaced, mainly by boys from New York, Boston, and Philadelphia. High-spirited kids, so devoted to hard cussing, Davison has circulated a printed command to cease and desist. Captain Gary started as an enlisted man himself. Unspeakably, he has drilled his crew to act by the book. For Big Ben, with all her great striking power, is also fearfully vulnerable. An immense steel case bomb in her packed with 1,850 tons of explosives, 40 gallons of high-octane gasoline. Now at dawn, all is quiet. After a night of air alerts that kept the crew continuously at battle stations. Men have been sent below in batches for the first hot meal in two days. Cereal, scrambled eggs, coffee. They relish every last second of relaxation allowed them from the tension of standing at general quarters. 6.58 a.m. Topside keeps a close sky watch as the bombers continue launching. Seven oh three a.m. A sister ship suddenly calls. Enemy plane closing on you. Captain Gary orders a redoubled search, visual and radar. Seven oh five a.m. Antenna strained appears the cloud bank up ahead. Nothing shows either to radar or the eye. At 7 a.m., still nothing. Suddenly, from a thousand yards up ahead, the object of the search swoops. And at 7.08 a.m., pound bombs landed, firing off the ship's own explosives, raining death on six decks downward, four decks upward in the island. Big Ben stands in the sea like the flaming mushroom of a nuclear explosion. It seems impossible that flesh, even armor plate, can survive. March 19th, Captain Gary's found himself in charge of a disaster. Well, we were launching, and I was standing just about right here watching the planes take off, uh, rolling up the deck, when I uh, received a, a message that the Hancock had a bogey on their screen somewhere forward of us. And I was bending over, speaking into that thing there, when there was a tremendous whoop and I, uh, an explosion, and I was knocked to the deck. When I got to my feet, I uh, turned to Commander Jerika, my navigator, who was standing right beside me, and said to him, what hit us? And he said, a bomb. He just went by the flight deck. At that moment, I was looking out ahead again, and a sheet of flame seemed to come out from under the starboard side of the flight deck forward and swept aft along the starboard side. Of the there was a heavy explosion, and that forward elevator just came right up into the air and then fell back in a cockeyed fashion. And then uh, a tremendous column of smoke uh, came pouring out of that uh, forward elevator. And uh, this smoke came right back down and enveloped the whole bridge. Sometime later during the morning, I'm not quite sure of the time, uh, when the worst of the the explosion seemed to have uh, subsided. The Admiral came up here on the bridge along with his chief of staff and some other staff officers and uh, asked if I could get a destroyer along uh, to get, take them off. The Admiral saying that he was sorry to leave me under such but he had to get along with his part in the war. Just before he, the Admiral uh, t t said to me, uh, 
that he thought it was about time I abandoned the ship, and uh, his chief of staff uh, said to me, uh, I suggest you abandon uh, over the starboard bow. Well, I didn't think this was my business, really, because I was in command of the ship. Uh, I had no intention to abandon the ship. I'd been brought up that in the Navy to believe that the captain's job was to save his ship. Below decks, as the bombs tore through, there was no way of knowing what was happening. Working in the captain's administrative office on the second deck, 20 feet from the slanting path of the first bomb, was Joe Lafferty, yeoman second class. When we were relieved from general quarters, I headed for this office. So I walked into the office, I talked to one of the naval correspondents who was writing human interest stories about members of the crew for the consumption of the hometown newspapers. I looked up at him, a bomb blew up, he disappeared, the flames, like a blowtorch in my face, seared my face and blew out my ears and I yelled, oh my God, my ears, they're gone. I made my way to the nearest first aid station. It was during this time that as I reminisced about the good crew we had, I also remember the captain, who was a strict disciplinarian. He wasn't running for any popularity contest. But the crew itself, when they were under fire in a disaster like this, the best came out of them. Another three decks down, far below the waterline, Richard Fulfar, fireman water tender second class, was standing watch in the number one forward fire room. My first thought was that the ammunition that had been prepared above us on the uh, mess deck had exploded. Uh, we could hear water swishing around, and we weren't quite sure whether uh, the compartment had been completely flooded. However, the uh, message came to us over the sound-powered uh, communication system that we had been hit. We were asked by the bridge uh, to maintain uh, pressure as long as we could and stay on our stations as long as we could. Stationed in number one forward engine room, where men were dropping heat and smoke at their posts, was machinist mate third class Frank Lepore. This was my watch when we were hit. So I went for my gas mask on the rail back in back of me here and put it on. And all of a sudden, it was so thick, the smoke down here, you couldn't see anyone that came close to you. Lieutenant was passed down on the deck. And then we secured all our engines here, because we didn't have much steam. We got word about the secure, we did. And one of the officers came down and showed us the way to come up through the hatch. We walked out hand by hand and out to the uh. The crew fought on. But by 10 a.m., the Franklin lay dead in the water. Her head falling off to starboard in a 13-degree list, engines gone, water mains ruptured, no communications but two short lines of sound-powered foam. And she had drifted to within 52 miles of Japan. Well, I was later asked why I did not abandon the ship. I knew that if we abandoned the ship, the next thing would happen with the uh, destroyers with us would be ordered to uh, soccer with torpedoes and sink her. And uh, there was always in my mind what happened to have happened on the Yorktown, that there were some men down below trapped in compartments way down the ship when they hit her with the torpedoes to sink her. And I knew I had a great number of men down below in the spaces below. We hadn't been able to get out yet. And I was just not about to uh, let all those men go down with the ship. On the third deck, 300 men were jammed shoulder to shoulder in the crew's mess. Rion Hillegas, seaman second class, was one to seek refuge in what was soon to become a smoke-filled trap. When the ship was hit, I was coming out of the galley with two, two gallons of coffee. Uh, of course, like everybody else, I hit the deck, and I dropped a gallon of coffee over the fellows in the galley, and a gallon of coffee over the fellows in the passageway. 
Everybody kept their head right to the deck. Then after maybe a half a minute, we began to get up off of the deck, and, and I just felt like we were really trapped. And at the time, I was mass cooking, so I was very familiar with this compartment here. And I knew that it was the one compartment that we could seal off, and it was the one compartment that we could get some air in. But this right here was our only source of air while we were in here. I would say within 10 minutes, the compartment was pretty well filled up. While sitting here, I couldn't help but remember that although it was March the 19th out here, that back home in Norfolk, it was March the 18th, the day after St. Patrick's Day. And I knew that my mother and father had been out for their usual St. Patrick's Day party with the Flaherty's and the Sullivan's and the McConaughey's. And I at this hour, on that day back in, in Norfolk, that they were probably feeling the effects of the party the night before. But they just uh, would never know what a horrible predicament I was in here this morning. Hour after hour, major explosions tore the ship and lifted it in the water. Men wounded and burned were snatched from the fires and helped to an emergency aid station where Weldon Gatlin, a Protestant chaplain, took charge. Father Joseph O'Callaghan, a Catholic chaplain, walked the tilted deck to give the last rites. Father O'Callaghan was very popular in the ship and everyone knew him and he seemed to know everybody. And on this day, if I first noticed him, I could identify him down around the deck because he had a big white cross painted on the front of his helmet. And uh, we had a dressing station up forward there where they were wounded. And he was up there assisting with that. And then I would see him come back down the middle of the deck here and men would be being brought out and there'd be a big and they'd run back. And then they would kind of cluster around uh, uh, the chaplain and they'd walk right back in with him. They seemed to think he had a charmed life and I began to think so too. It was still another extraordinary act that brought Father O'Callaghan the first Medal of Honor awarded a Navy chaplain. Just forward of the bridge, heat fumes and smoke rose suddenly from a five-inch gun turret, threatening to blow up the whole island and the ship's command. At once, Father O'Callaghan quickly rounded up a work party to take a turret and climbed right in with him to help pass out the shells and drop them over the side. I remember saying to somebody, that's about the bravest man I've ever seen. So this was so clearly above and beyond the call of duty and at the risk of his life, and without detriment to his mission, and certainly in the face of the enemy, uh, he fulfilled every uh, requirement, every uh, criteria for the Congressional Medal of Honor. The Navy was his first parish. Until then, he had been a teaching priest. It was on his name day, the Feast of St. Joseph, that the scholar became a man of action. The same day, 19 years later, he would die. Remembered with love by third class Robert Blanchard for what happened on this exact spot. I came up to the flight deck after being trapped below for some time. And when I came up to the flight deck, I was in a semi-conscious state because of the smoke and my throat was burning. And the next minute I knew, I saw Father O'Callaghan bending over me. For me, I, the last rites and the sign of the cross I figured this was it, this was the end, and I kept thinking about all the time I was during the day praying that I could get home to my wife and daughter and raise a family, and I thank God that I was able to do so. Nine a.m., two hours after the bombs hit, down below, among the men the captain had resolved to rescue, 300 were now facing death by suffocation. George Shapiro, five-letter college athlete, was serving at age 44 as an electrician's mate second class, the oldest enlisted man on board, inevitably called Pop by his teenage shipmates. I remember very distinctly uh, our medical officer, Dr. Fueling, uh, telling us not to get excited. 
But he told us that if you wish to, you can pray to the Almighty God. I'll never forget that incident. He also said if you pray, don't pray out loud. Pray to yourself pray to yourself. so you can conserve the air yeah. that was in here. After waiting about two hours to be saved, and assuming it was practically hopeless, I saw an officer come in, and it was Commander Gary. This guy is the guy who really saved us. Lieutenant Gary, up from the ranks, 25 years in the Navy. His Medal of Honor citation reads, unhesitatingly he risked his life to assist several hundred men trapped in the messing compartment filled with smoke and with no apparent egress. When I found that peephole with the light in it and the door ajar and saw that little light in here, I was attracted to this compartment too. And I remember that as we came in, it sounded like thunder and the ship was shaking like a cat would shake a little mouse. I also remember of ducking under this ammunition hoist into a squatting position. Then I thought, you can't protect me that much. I might just as well stand up. After an hour and a half, I thought there must be some way out of here. And if there is a way out, I'll find it. So with the long lines of the men behind him, he groped through this ammunition hatch, along black passageways. Each man clutching blindly to the belt of the man ahead of him, gasping, choking, slipping in the ooze of scrambled eggs, cereal, and pounds that had spilled from the galley. Just beyond the galley hatch, I knew that I had to turn right and into the uptake spaces. That's the door I had to feel for. From there, down to the fourth deck. And then, in a stooped position, under main steam lines, right intake air duct. From there, looking straight up, you can see a faint light. And climbing 50 feet up, and looking from here, we could see the screen in the skin of the ship. And that was our goal. Kicking out the screen, it was an easy drop to the catwalk below and the first clean air in hours. Three times, Lieutenant Gary went back to guide the trapped men to this point. And finally up the ladder to the flight deck, where the men, saved from suffocation, found everything in flames. For hours, the ship remained under savage attack from her own bombs, shells, and rockets. Gasoline poured over the side in a flaming Niagara. Below, men still were dying by fire, smoke, drowning, execution. Amos Shields, Stewart's mate first class, found his own way up after an agonizing search. In the Navy at that time, most Negroes ranked as cooks and waiters but during battle, served alongside the shipmates as gunners. There was about 100 of us on the ship. My duty was to serve the officers, but our battle stations on 20 and 40 millimeter guns and on ammunition. I first attempted to come up amidship, and I was uh, turned back by the flame. So I went across to the port side, and the same thing happened. So the thing to do for me was to go forward. And I started working my way forward through the officers' quarters, and I finally came up in this hatch here. At that time, I couldn't get to my battle station, so I started working, uh, throwing off live ammunition and anything that was on the flight deck that would keep the ship from being in balance. 
Like medics on a battlefield, other ships of the task force rally to the wounded Franklin. In a daring feat of seamanship, Captain Harold C. Fitz rams his heavy cruiser, the Santa Fe, into the outboard catwalks of the still-burning Franklin in order to lock the ships and hold them steady while bringing hundreds of wounded and unneeded personnel over a bridge improvised from Big Ben's fallen radio mast. Only some 700 of the crew remained to man the Franklin. Heedless of the continuing air attacks and the threat of further explosions on the Franklin, the rescue ships move in closer and closer. Pittsburgh, standing by to take the Franklin in tow, throws a messenger line hitched to tons of steel. Big Ben's power winches are dead. With superhuman strength born of necessity, 70 crewmen haul through the sea by hand. Finally, agonizing two knots, the Franklin is dragged away toward Ulithi Lagoon. Well, all that long day from the time the uh, bomb hit us in the morning, uh, within arm's reach, it seemed, uh, uh, was one of my marine orderlies, a young 19-year-old private first class named Wally Klimquintz. He was always there. He made me put on my helmet because he said that had been the captain's orders. He uh, made me put on my life belt because that had been the captain's orders. 22 of his Marine buddies were killed that day, most of them by a direct hit on the Marine compartment. I guess things were pretty rough at, at times, but uh, we're all human, and I guess we all fear personal injury and, and even death, but uh, somehow or other, why, uh, we had enough faith to stick it out Thank God that uh, things worked out. We're the fortunate ones that are here to relate the story to others. Another story of faith was what happened that day to William Farrell, now a Roman Catholic priest. He was 18 then, a yeoman third class. Stationed in the personnel office on the second deck, 30 feet from the falling path of the first bomb. On that particular tragic day, there's one thing that I've always noted, and that's that all along the way, there was someone to help. Shipmates, men I didn't even know, but all along the way, there was someone to lead me, to help me. There were nine of us in this office on March 19th, and all of a sudden, we heard uh, what sounded like a rumble was the actual bomb hit. I asked Lieutenant Hathaway, how do we get out of here? And he said to me, I don't know, kid. He was sitting at his desk, and those were the last words that he ever spoke. Of the nine of us in this compartment, only three of us lived. I went out through this hatchway groping because of the dark smoke. There was no way to tell which way we were going. I finally found the hatchway after stepping over several dead bodies. And in groping through the passageway, I touched a tangled mass of steel, at which point the skin on both hands came off. I walked into the marine compartment, the worst possible place that I could have gone. Most of the men were dead. At that point, my lungs became so full of this smoke, my, my throat was on fire, I couldn't actually see anymore. I fell through an open hatch and broke a rib in doing it. But 
Someone down below deck saw me and pulled me into an airtight compartment. We formed a chain, and in trying to get over the hatchway, I lost the chain. Someone came back for me. They hoisted me up into the warrant officer's mess. And in going through there, I asked one of the men if I could have a little drink of water. It was in a spittoon with just about everything, cigarette butts, halves of oranges, and other fruit, just about everything. And this was the water I was given, the best water I've ever tasted in my life. They finally got me to sick bay, and the medics took care of me from that point on. Father O'Callaghan gave me the last rites. Limping to harbor, the Franklin was still a number one target for the Japanese, eager to finish off. Twice enemy planes swooped in, one dropping a bomb just off the starboard quarter. Both were shot down. By early afternoon, the major explosions had died down, but the fire still raged. In the steering engine room in the fifth deck aft, between all the burning ship and the cold sea, five boys stuck to their posts in order to crank a ton of rudder by hand, the only way left to steer the ship. One of these boys was Holbrook Davis, quartermaster second class. Five of us stood by. There wasn't anything to do for a little We certainly were fully aware of the fantastic uh, explosions and fire uh, above us and almost beside us. As the day wore on, and as it got into the afternoon, the middle of the afternoon, we were pretty anxious to get out. We had pretty serious discussions amongst ourselves as to whether we should give it a try but uh, decided that uh, we better not. Uh, of course, we were in uh, continual communication with the bridge, which, was a, which probably saved our lives because we would have been so desperate had we not been, we would have tried to get out. Lieutenant Robert Wassman, 24, assistant navigator, volunteered to make good a promise by the bridge to rescue the men in steering aft. Gil Abbott, one of the quartermasters in my division, and I proceeded to find a way to the steering engine room. We tried this first by going aft, above the hangar, dip, hangar deck, by means of the series of catwalks rigged on the starboard side of the ship. We got to the fan tail, found at this point Several men had been trapped and lost, but we found one boy, apparently severely wounded. We found a blanket or something that we helped use as a sling. We dragged him forward from the far end of the ship, across the deck, still burning, jagged, torn, wrecked, rubble of airplanes, humanity and inhumanity, everything terrible. For five hours, Bob Wassman searches for a way to steering aft, accompanied by Quartermaster Abbott, later by Quartermaster Varelik. The search zigzags along smoldering corridors, past burning compartments, around floods from planes, through a seaboard cemetery where boys lie motionless in their berths or face down in water. The searchers push on. There is no witness to their ordeal and their actions but themselves. It would be easy to turn back. They twist and turn through dangers that nearly take their lives. Backtrack from one blind alley and dead end into another, desperately aware that the oxygen and steering aft will soon give out. Finally, 17 hours after the bombs fell, Liberation comes to the men in steering aft. Well, that was a time, certainly, we were grateful to see you. The next job was out of there. So we said, let's grab hands, cover your face, take a deep breath, and follow us.
Bridge learned by midnight that all the living men below had finally been brought out. Now, a captain had to concern himself with the dead. Uh, our first job was to get all the bodies out of the ship, and this was pretty bad. And there were so many of them, and they were so badly burned and in a horrible condition. And we had no time and no material or to go through a really formal or proper burial services. And it was a, it was a terrible, terrible experience. Willie Woods, Cook second class, was himself still bearing scars from the kamikaze attack six months before. So our job was to uh, go below deck and find the dead, bring them up, whole bodies and parts, and bury them at sea. And we did that clean on up till we got into Honolulu. So when we got there, we was able to eat. But until then, we just couldn't, couldn't do anything. We just work and drink coffee, more or less. We all stuck it out, and we made it all the way in. By next morning, the crews of the engine and fire room were back below, patching up power and steam lines, building up speed to six knots, 10 knots, 14, and Big Ben cast off a tow line. The order of the day was a ship that won't be sunk, can't be sunk. Down below in the hangar deck, torn open to the sky, where a firestorm had in a flash killed every last man, the living now gathered to pray for the dead and give thanks for the miracle of their own survival. The final muster, 724 dead, 265 wounded. Chaplain Gatlin conducted the Protestant service. Father O'Callaghan, as well as saying mass, spoke the Hebrew words of the Jewish service for the dead. There was also a prayer for their commander-in-chief, President Franklin Roosevelt, who died while CV-13 was steaming home. A quarter of her crew left behind in the waters of the Pacific. Father O'Callaghan wrote a book about Franklin entitled, uh, I Was Chaplain of the Franklin. And along in the latter part of it, he stated that I was not a very religious. Well, I never made any great show of being religious, but neither was I irreligious. And at one point, when I was in the pilot house, at the worst part of the explosions, and when we were smothered in smoke, I could feel within myself a fear rising. And uh, everybody gets afraid under these conditions. The, uh, the thing to do is you don't show it, and you have to keep on doing what you've got to do. And then I think I closed my eyes for a minute, and a very strange thing happened to me. Uh, somewhere inside my head, I seemed to hear a voice in a very, almost a clear, bell-like tone started to, re to recite a part of the 23rd Psalm. And I stood there for this moment and heard these the lovely words of this psalm. And then, all of a sudden, I knew everything was going to be all right. Soon, the Franklin was making normal speed. At Pearl Harbor, it was found that the tough warrior had not sprung a single plate in her hull. But the interior damage was too great for Pearl Harbor to cope with, and she was ordered home. 704 officers and men took their way to New York, a ship that few had expected would ever get away from Japan. All that long voyage home from the place we were hit to Ulithi, to Pearl Harbor, to Panama, to New York, I think the crew must have thought I was some kind of a Simon Legree because I, I worked the officers and men from sunup till sundown. The purpose was to keep those men busy. They'd seen a great many of their shipmates uh, die or be burned or blown over the side. And I knew that if I didn't keep them so busy, 
that at night they would be so dead tired and exhausted that they, I would have a crew of, uh, of mental cases by the time I got the ship home. A ghost ship with a skeleton to Franklin made port on April 28th, 40 days after lying dead in the water. The ship got to New York. She was extraordinarily, unbelievably cleaned up condition, and I didn't have a single cycle case on that ship when I got back. And I had probably the proudest, cockiest crew that any ship in any Navy ever had. The citations read, for self-sacrificing valor under the most perilous conditions, for leading and inspiring the crew, for conspicuous gallantry at the risk of his life. courage in the highest tradition. So they came home. The most decorated ship and the most decorated crew in the history of the United States Navy. The war ended before the repaired Franklin could return combat. Now she dies hard. It took 10 months to build her, years to destroy her. The burner's torch accomplishes what Japanese bombers could not. As this ship dies, it's like a part of me dying. I went every place this ship went, and I was on it when it was decommissioned. I love her, and I always will love her. who have never been close to shipboard or mariners' lives, no one can realize the love that a person would have for a ship. being hospitalized on Guam, I found that the ship was returning from Pearl Harbor to the United States. I begged the doctor to let me go. I begged him because I had to go back with this ship. This was my home, my motherland. ship has a heart. I believe it. Being back here now, I must say, it's a rather sad experience to know that it'll be the last time that I'll see the Frank. The performance of that crew, I think, is one of the uh, really great uh, things in the history of the United States Navy. Uh, many of them at sea for the first time, many of them in combat for the first time, but the manner in which they performed, the uh, way they supported each other, they were innumerable, incredible, and unknown acts of self-sacrifice and heroism on that ship. And then when the people lived together and worked together and trained together and then finally have fight together and help to save each other in bad time, then they become a community and a, and a family, their shipmates. 
once a shipmate, you've always been a shipmate, and that's what makes a ship go. The ship is dead, but the heritage of the Franklin lives on. Dean Kincaid, one of the ship's company, remembers, in that terrible time, we were transformed into a living whole, utterly without bias, color consciousness, creed. In my lifetime, nothing will compare to those hours when everybody was his brother's keeper.